Let us pray together. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you remember in 2019 when there were all those headlines about people who were growing horns? I know it's hard to remember any news headlines before the pandemic, but there was a story out of Australia that found that young people had this extra long bone right at the base of their skulls. And they theorized, since it was found more with those in the 18 to 30 year old category versus those who were older, that this was somehow environmental. And what if it was because they were staring at their phones all day long? I admit, I totally took the bait and told my kids that if they looked at their devices too much, they too would grow horns. It worked really well for about two weeks, and I think they decided if everyone else has horns too, it'll be trendy in the end. It turns out that the headlines were a bit exaggerated, shocking, and that they hadn't even done the work to measure if those who had this longer neck bone also had increased cell phone use. It was a gross generalization about young people. And since the, pan since the pandemic, I haven't seen any studies. Apparently, we have more to worry about than a generation of horned children. Except something about this initial assumption of the researchers, while not scientific, might still have something to say about who we are as a people at this moment. We are, to whatever degree, bent over people. As we bend over our phones or watches or laptops, most of our lives we spend bent over for one reason or another. And so I think there is something for us to learn from this bent woman in our scripture this morning. I have to admit, this text at first felt a little obvious. I mean, much of the Bible is actually obvious if we let it be. Love your neighbor about as yourself is obvious but also terribly hard to do and trust, but obvious all the same. But this text with Jesus healing some poor woman with some terrible malady and then being chided for it by religious authorities because he did it on the wrong day seemed like a lesson in don't take your religion too seriously, which I'm just not sure, at least for our church, is an issue. I'm not sure it would be all that challenging for us to spend 15 minutes talking about how we shouldn't let our religious traditions get in the way of us loving people. I dare to say if I asked you to really define your religion, most of you would say whether or not you crossed into the church didn't matter. It was whether or not you loved people. So what is there for us to learn from this bent-over woman? Ultimately, there is no point in trying to diagnose her ailment. All we hear is that there was a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. A spirit had crippled her. Now, we all know there were not science books or medical schools back then to appropriately diagnose the many ailments we read about in Scripture. But what if we actually take this one at its word? Not that she had undiagnosed scoliosis, but a spirit. This unnamed woman in scripture has only been able to look at the ground in front of her for 18 years. That was the beauty in that reading that Greg and Ellie offered to us. She'd been looking at the ground. And that is labeled as crippling to her. But I wonder what they'll say about our horned children in another 2,000 years. Might not that be a spirit as well? It just got me thinking about what it means to look at the ground, to be bent over. The reality is that if you go out into our world, that is what you see. Restaurants with families waiting together for a table and everyone is bent over their phones. Family dinners, parties, almost everywhere you go, if you watch people, you will see them bent over, looking down. And while we could blame them and say they should just put their devices away, naming this as a crippling spirit might have some truth. Because as much as we do all have agency over our choices, 
we can't ignore the reality that there are pressures in our world right now intentionally working to push on us until we are indeed bent over. I imagine those pressures are different for all of us, but I wonder, why do you look down at your phone or your computer or your screen? Is it out of loneliness so the phone is a form of connection? Are you seeking information, news, such that you are so worried and stressed about the world that you have to know more, you have to hear more? What are you looking for, though? Are you looking for good news to balance all of the bad or confirmation of just how terrible it all is? Or do you look searching for inspiration? Is there a feeling of emptiness and you believe that maybe a wise quote might provide you with the meaning in your life you are hungry for? I think all of these are real needs, but the spirit that cripples us is that we have this we have these, and the force of it is intentional. Scrolling isn't like when we used to open a newspaper with a front page and a last page, and you know when you get to the comics, you're almost done. But you have to take time for the comics, right? You can scroll all day and night because that is what it is designed for, to keep our attention, to consume us, to consume our resources, be that resources of energy or attention or our financial resources. It is like a spirit that bends us over little by little until we are unable to look up. But we're not all smartphone people. The same can be said for the 24-hour news cycle, like a spirit that pushes on us so much that days turn into years. The spirit that presses us into this bent position permeates our culture. After all, don't we all value the expression, just keep your head down? It implies we need to go about our days and do our work focusing only on what is immediately before us. Keeping your head down is not just how we end up living in this world. It is the way we aim to do so, as if there is no other way to traverse this life than the way of this woman bent over looking only at ourselves and my work and my situation and my next step and the place and the circumstances that are mine, as if that is all we are able to do. Which somehow feels like this amazing oxymoron with the phones because our phone tra traverses the planet in an instant. So it doesn't feel like it's all about me and keeping my head down, and yet the posture for both is the same. Both cripple us. But then comes Jesus. And he sees the woman that has been bent over for so long that she doesn't even ask for help. Maybe she doesn't know she needs it anymore. Maybe she didn't even see Jesus walk in. Let's not pretend there aren't times that Jesus could walk into our living rooms and we wouldn't even look up. But Jesus calls her toward him and she comes and he says, Woman, you are set free. And he touches her, and she stands up straight, free from the spirit that bent her over. Set free. She is set free to stand up. She is set free to no longer look down, but to look up and to look out. Jesus sets her free, and it changes everything. You know, I didn't want to spend our time today talking against religious leaders who take their law and religion too seriously for a lot of reasons. As I said, I think we know the truth that preacher Barbara Brown Taylor has said. She said, when my religion tries to, be, tries to come between me and my neighbor, I will choose my neighbor because Jesus never commanded me to love my religion. I, think that's new th I don't think that's new thinking for us. It's beautiful, but not new. Instead, what at least I, I needed to hear from this story is who Jesus is and what he does, not necessarily for us, but to and with us. Jesus sets us free. He helps us to stand up for ourselves and for others. He makes clear that keep your head down is not the way we were called or created to move 
through this world. When we encounter Jesus, when we hear about his way and his call and his grace and his peace and his persistence and his vulnerability and his love for self and neighbor and earth, we are set free to a wider vision of the world and our place within it. Actually, you know, that is what the religious leaders needed as well. They needed that change in perspective to be set free, to see the people more than the Sabbath. And for all the preachers who have pointed out those religious leaders' failings over time and thereby cast off the Sabbath, we too must see that the Sabbath is one beautiful way of freeing us from all that bends us over in the chaos of life. As I heard the woman say, as Ellie narrated it, the Sabbath can be beautiful and liberating as well. That's the thing, after all. It was never that there was something wrong with the Sabbath, just like there is nothing wrong with our phones or social media or putting our head down to focus on what is before us. Jesus' work is to free us from anything and all things that so overwhelm us that we are bent over and thereby can't live in gratitude for the fullness of this life. Because that is what this woman ultimately does if we let her be our teacher in this story. When the woman stands, when she is set free, she praises God. And then we hear the crowds rejoice. Could it be that simple? That Jesus sets us free to live in gratitude? Because we can be grateful for our phones and for the news that informs us and for the work and for the life that is before us and for the laws and for religious wisdom that guides us. When we are free to give thanks, we are healed for the fullness of life that God has created us for. That is what Jesus does. He frees us. He frees us from all the systems and pressure and rigidity that bind us. So whatever pressure presses on us so much that we feel we are crippled over, Jesus can be the one to help us stand up. That is what we do here when we come and when we listen and we follow Jesus, standing up when the world tries to push us down, standing up against oppression, standing up against patriarchy and consumerism and chaos, This thing we are doing, this life of faith, following the way of Jesus' love and justice and hope, always leads us, guides us towards freedom. And that is worthy of our praise. Amen.